It's national meets regional. Welcome to Sidewalks Entertainment, the long-running celebrity, music, and art series. Join us now for an exciting new path to celebrity interviews, music, rising talents, and much, much more. Hey guys, welcome back to Sidewalks Entertainment. Today we're coming to you from Classic Comic Con and one of the themes of this show is saluting the original Battlestar Galactica. And I have an actor here who was on the original Battlestar Galactica. He played Bo J, a fighter pilot. I'd like to welcome Jack Stauffer to the show. How are you doing? I've, I'm doing great. And, and it's funny, you know, the, orig the original series, this is like celebrating the Old Testament. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're just about in that category now. So, you know, you'll, you'll forgive us sometimes if, you know, if we drool or forget things. But. <laughs> yeah, let's let's start off from the beginning. Uh, were you born? In, you were from L.A. area? No, originally I, no. I, I grew up in New York. Yep. Oh, New York. I was I was an in, an interesting family. My family was half show business, half West Point, and um, the battles that went on in my house over uh, over the Vietnam War were quite ex quite extraordinary, which was you know my high school years and stuff. And uh, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I knew what I wanted to do at age five. I, it's, it's, it's strange in today's world where um, so many young people don't seem to have an ambition or seem lost. I, I had a sense of myself when I was very young, and I knew there was something in me that just said, I need to be out front. I think Donald Trump is a lot like that. <laughs> he, he doesn't want to be president. He wants to be the biggest movie star out there. Anyway. I knew I'd get something political in. Okay. <laughs> but five years old, uh, you, you said, I want to be an actor. Uh, what, what, how long did it take before you actually did your first role? I um, actually did a, f a couple of things when I was young. And then like anybody who grew up on the East Coast, you went to boarding school. And um, so I was always in the drama productions in boarding school. And um, then I went to Northwestern University for their theater department. And... Uh, and again, just knew this is uh, where I had to be. Interestingly enough, you know, my father, who, you know, was part of the entertainment industry, kept trying to yank me out of it because, you know, he, he would tell me, you know, you need to have a business degree so when you fall flat on your butt as an actor, you'll have something to fall back on. And, uh, but I, I was stubborn. I, uh, you know, I did it and I got out of Northwestern in 1968 and my father said, you don't live here anymore, you want to be an actor? go so I took my car which was my graduation present from college sold it moved into New York City and uh, you know it, it, thinking back the memories I, I think in many ways those were the happiest days of my life I mean you could be young and broke in New York in 1969 and uh, it was so adventurous I mean you've, uh, people that we hung out together, you know, Paul Michael Glazer, Tom Skerritt, Danny DeVito, nobody knew what any, any of us were. And, I mean, we were all starving. And, and we, <laughs> we would find places to eat. We, there was a place in Chinatown that Wednesday night had the all-you-could-eat buffet. I had no idea what it was because it was all in Chinese, but we knew it was $3. And they would see us come in and go, oh, no, 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 you can, ow, you can, ow, no, come here, no, you eat too much. And we would go in here and just devour. There was an Italian restaurant that on Thursday night had the spaghetti dinner, all you can eat, and we would, you know, devour. But that's what you did. And... Um, you know, you just, as the money dwindled and you didn't want to go home, and I got my first job. Um, and then I went out on tour, uh, you know, in theater. And then I came back to New York and got cast in All My Children. I was one of the original stars of All My Children. And that, that started it. And then I was lucky enough to be one of the working actors you know, there's a big difference between the stars and the working actors. And I was one of the working actors for over 40 years. Yeah. So, I don't know, because you got me, after you mentioned the buffet and Chinese food, I got hungry <laughs> there. Uh, but what was your first role you ever got? I don't think you said it. Okay, the first job I ever got was a Clearasil commercial, and I leaned out of the phone booth and went, I got my date, and you can too, if your skin is clear with Clearasil. <laughs> and I... Over the course of my career, I, I can honestly say the vast amount of my income came from doing commercials. I did over 250. Wow. Yep, yep. There was an actor in Hollywood named Squire Fidel who is known as Mr. Commercial. He's the only one who did more than I did. 
Yeah. So that should be a Guinness Book of World Record right there. You know, it, it, was, it was looked down upon originally because a serious actor would never sell a soul out for a commercial until you went out to the mailbox and took out the paychecks from talent and residuals and mm-hmm. saw the residuals and you know they kept they kept you eating yeah well you said mention uh, all my children uh, if i'm not mistaken you played chuck yep. on the show um what was like what was like that working on that series again i i would again if i could undo one decision in my professional career it would have been the decision to leave that show and and i won't go into it because it would take way too long but it was I um, was getting married to a very well-known actress who was well known on the West Coast and they wanted her there and I knew in my heart it was a bad decision you never walk away from a job and it was 52 weeks a year again the, yes. the hardest thing about this industry is the ups and downs of it the insecurities the you work so hard to get a job and then you're in the job and you're doing what you love to do and then it's over and then you have to go back down to the bottom of that you know that cycle again and and climb back up all my children um, we were the first show that made young people the stars and that was Karen Gorney Richard Hatch myself and 22 year old Susan Lucci Um, we started in January of 1970 and the people they surrounded us with were the creme de la creme of, of soap opera. Um, and they were there under the understanding that they were going to nurture us. And they did. And, and it was so important to me at the time as an actor and, and throughout my entire career and now at the end of my career where my primary focus is in paying forward what I know and paying forward that incredible gift um, that these people gave to us, to nurture us, and to teach us, and to move us forward, and not be um, have an ego of of, of their own. Um, I loved it. I I I was lucky enough with my theater background that I could learn the lines quickly. Um, but you know, you you weren't out of work, and you know, I I would say they were the happiest times of my life. Yeah, I love that show. Do you have a favorite scene, favorite moment on that? On All My Children? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the moments that... Now, you have to realize this show was shot what they call live on tape, and this was in the early days of tape. And there were very, very few redos because you didn't have access to the tape machines for that long. Anyway, there was the great scene where Dr. Joe Ray McDonald, Mary Fickett, and I come in the door with Richard Hatch and Karen Gorney. They're the love duo. And they go around, and they're having this big thing at the fire, and there's this trauma, and there's love gone awry and all that. And I'm playing the best friend, which is what Chuck was. And it was a snowy day, and you can see the snow come down outside the windows. <laughs> and so Richard and Karen go down to the fireplace, and the cameras are on Ray and myself and, and Mary up by the front door. And Ray says, Chuck, let me hang up your coat. And I give him the coat, and he opens the closet door. Of course, it's snowing in the closet because the roller that's got all the snow has gone extended <laughs> down and I take one look at the snow pouring down in the closet and Mary Fickett chokes right trying not to laugh Ray McDonald didn't bat an eye he said Chuck you know when the weather clears tomorrow could I get your help going up on the roof and fix that leak because we've got to try to try to do that now Mary Fickett has gone to the window upstage right because she's laughing so hard the mascara is coming down her face and she's smart enough to turn her back so nobody sees her Cam- you know we're still going we're still going. They're trying not. They're trying not to stop this, and I'm going. And Ray McDonald's saying his lines. He's saying Mary Fick's lines. He's saying my lines. And you can hear the crew going. And and they finally had to stop it. They they stopped it. But it's called you know the great snowstorm in the closet story. Yep, happened. True. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, were you, you talking about doing these shows for 50, uh, 52 weeks a year, pretty much? Uh, how do you? Me- I can't memorize anything. <laughs> How do you memorize lines? Do you have a trick to it? Yep. You don't memorize lines. And this gets into technique and training and, and thought. You memorize thoughts. Um, you, you memorize, uh, you learn what your intent is and what you want to do. And again, as I was trained, and as I've always, as a director, theater director, always trained, if you know why you do or say something, you can repeat that. If you just learn the lines and have no idea why you learned these lines, you will forget them. It, it comes out of the method, the Adler 
method of, of acting. Um, I was never what I call a true method actor, but I took that concept of it. And I always thought if I know why I'm doing something, then I will be able to repeat that action. And that's my mantra when I direct. So um, we were lucky to have good writers, too, that the lines did kind of flow together. I mean, if we said, well, let's go out to dinner. Where do you want to go? How about the Chinese restaurant? No, I don't like Chinese food. Well, that progression, you kind of knew, again, all right, what are we talking about? Then that progression would kind of fall into place. The hardest thing was always when somebody would change the topic. Yeah. Oh, how about them giants? Huh? Well, <laughs> but no, I mean, I... You couldn't, you couldn't ad-lib too much, or, or could no. you? No, you, cu you couldn't. The only, it's because, again, the script was laid out, yeah. and, and the camera angles were laid out, and the camera movements were laid out. So, no, you had to stick pretty much to do it. Now, we did have leeway in syntax. Um, you know, if, if you had a line that said, um, you know, D do you want to go see to the movie here or go over there? And you said, well, how about the movie here or over there? As long as the intent was there, all my children was 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 fine. Years later when I went on Young and Restless, I was actually fired. The only time in my life I was fired because they would not let you change the syntax. And they wrote in a very funny way. And the line that got me fired was, at 8 o'clock the dinner we're having starts. And I just changed it to, well, we're having dinner at 8. And I was ridiculed in front of the entire cast by the executive producer oh, no. who I took an instant dislike to who said here we learn our lines and I was very very adamant about learning my lines and I said you better tell me what I didn't learn because I don't understand that criticism and he said told me that line and I said I said it I said we're having dinner date he said no here we say the lines as they are written so I looked at him and said, in other words, you want a line reading, not a performance. And nobody ever talked back to the executive producer on that show. <laughs> and I did. And I was fired two weeks later. That was the only time in my career I got fired. Wow. Yep. Yep. How, lo it too. <laughs> How long were you on um, uh, All My Children? Three and three quarter years. I did f almost 400 shows. Yeah. So doing 400 shows. And then you got a chance to play BoJ on Battlestar Galactica, the original series. On the, you started off on the two-parter uh, Living Legend with um, Ann Lockhart and uh, Lori Bridges. Um, a lot of people recognize you from that role. Remember, you, isn't it amazing? You know, it, you it is true. And, and what's, what's funny, too, is, again, you know, this came at a point in my life where I was probably at the peak of working. And they, Battlestar at that time, was in tremendous flux and they didn't know, you know, it, it was just in trouble. And they wanted to go back to the two hour format. They, they also needed something other than just the Cylons and running from the, yeah. the Cylons. So I was offered the role. Um, I actually didn't have to audition for it. I was offered the role because they were gonna bring in another strong male character and I had a tremendous working relationship over the years with Richard. Yeah who and I have been dear friends for since 1970. So Glenn knew that dynamic would not get into a cat fight on, on, on the set. And also bringing in the Pegasus um, gave an additional conflict within the fleet, something else other than the original silence because the Pegasus was the aggressive, you know, warrior battle star. And the Pegasus was always coming back. That was, that was a given, we knew that, that going in. In the original script that I got, BoJ was killed oh, wow. in the raid on Gamora um, in the two-hour episode. And halfway through filming, I got called to Glenn's office. Now, you get called to Glenn's office, to the producer's office. That's like getting <laughs> called, called into the manager's office. We're going to send you back to AAA. And uh, Glenn looked at me, and he said, what am I going to do with you? And I went, what I do wrong? He said, no, no, you he don't. That line you gave. Yeah, you don't, you don't understand. He said, you know, I, I need to keep you on the show. Um, he said, it's just what you bring is just this dynamic that I, I want to keep. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, but I don't know what to do with you because they had brought Anne into the show. And to keep another strong male character, now you had Richard and you had Dirk and you had Herb, to bring in another strong male character, the women were screaming that they didn't have enough to do. And Glenn looked at me and he said, I want to keep you on the show. Tell me how we're going to do it. And I looked at him and I went, why? 
why does this happen to me? I was not available. Oh, is that why you only appeared in a couple? I was, uh, this is how, how, it, how it played out. I was scheduled to do the two-hour Battlestar Galactica. Immediately after that, I was booked to do a two-hour police story. And behind that, I had a half-hour sitcom. I was booked out for six weeks. And I looked at Glenn, and Glenn said, you just solved my problem. He said, what I would love to do, he said, we'll work around your days off. I would like to keep you in each episode going forward, maybe a scene or two, which is why the two War of the Gods episodes, you know, there's the scenes of me and the Viper, yeah. and there's just a scene here and a scene there. And he said, you know, this way, um, I don't create problems for myself, and then when we go to year two, we're going to make changes, and, and we will make you an integral part of the show. And we never got to year year oh, wow. year two, but uh, how disappointing! I mean, uh, we we're talking to Ann Lockhart, and you know, she, she had no clue. No, nobody in the crew had no clue. Uh, none of us did. None of us did. We found out the show was canceled when we read the ABC schedule. and We weren't on it. Wow. Yeah, and and you know, I called Glenn, and uh, he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, they it, they didn't pick us up." You know, it, and it's and it's it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because you know, as as an actor, you. To have a series that's going forward means you're working, yeah. um, and to to be on a prime time series that is successful kicks you into what we used to call the A list, and the A list is where you have to be because now, you know all the you know the audition process back then. You know you now get to skip it. Yeah. And, and again, there are a lot of talented people out there. There were then. There are even more out, out there today. And any advantage you can get to be offered a role, you know, to do what you love to do, you take advantage of. So, I mean, I, you know, you know I, I look after Battlestar, and I did four pilots for my own series, and none of the four were picked up. And there's no reason why they didn't. They just didn't. The, uh, the last one... Um, that was the one that really broke my heart was they uh, it, it was the Doberman gang for television. Fred Silverman was the head of NBC. He wanted a dog show. We filmed it. I, it was my show. I was the star of it. It was at Columbia Television where I knew everyone, everyone. And we shot the hour and a half pilot and we had such a great time doing it. And I had dogs. Yeah. So here I am with five Dobermans and the Dobermans are in my lap half the time. And the show was charming and it was I, I remember th the gag was that the dogs had the motor home and I didn't. And so, so every day I would go and go, wait a minute, where's my motor home? I'm the star of the show. And every day the crew would strip something out of my little studio dressing room to the point that by the end of that hour and a half episode, I got dressed in the parking lot with a coat, hat, rack, rack with my wardrobe on it. I'd strip down stark naked right in the middle of the parking lot of Warner Brothers. I wouldn't give it, and they would all hang out the window and laugh. And we were indoors shooting the final interior scenes, and the executive producer was Harv Bennett, Harris Cattleman. Harv Bennett came down and said, just want you to know the network has ordered eight scripts. That's like saying, get on the plane and go to, to the majors. You're there. And we knew we were going. The next day was our last day shooting. And instead of breaking for lunch, everybody kind of hung around. And I went, OK, what are you going to do to me? And we walked down to the end and opened the two big studio hangar doors. And there was the Vogue motorhome with my name. And I burst into tears at that time. Um, we were on the air. We were going. They'd ordered the scripts and everything. And then um, Harv Bennett called me from the affiliates meeting four weeks later. We were, we were four weeks from going back to work um, and said the network decided at the last minute to go with Benji instead. So Benji went on the air and we didn't. Oh. Yep. And that, you know. Did Benji have it? it was Benji lasted a year. Was that Heroes Boomer or Benji? No, uh, Benji was, you know, the little fluffy dog. You, oh, know, okay. you know, I mean, it was. I it Benji have a show. Yeah, it came out of a commercial. Oh, okay. um, And, you know, who knows? You, uh, I'm sure every actor you will ever, ever talk to say, you know, and I say it over and over again, this business is 5% talent. 5% knowing the right people and 90% blind luck. And you have to be lucky. The most talented people, the most talented stars out there, uh, they may not be as good an actor as a lot of people, but they're luckier. Yeah. And, and uh, all the power to them, yep. I know there's more people out there who want to ask about Battlestar Galactica, but um, 
were you shocked when uh, they decided to come up with Galactica 1980? Um, yeah, because Glenn, Glenn um, was determined to try to keep the show on the air. He had to keep up with Aaron Spelling. <laughs> and 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 the show was the show was canceled mainly because it was so incredibly expensive. It was the first million dollar an episode show. Yeah. So Glenn really went to the network and said, "Don't take it off the air. Don't take it off the air. I can do it cheaper." And it it showed. Um, none of us wanted to to do that. And uh, once the show is gone, to you can't bring it back. Um, it it just doesn't work. It's like if you work for a company and you know another company calls you and makes you a better offer mm -hmm. and you walk away from this company now you get to the new place and you decide you don't like it you can't go back to the old place because yeah. you know what you did to them you walked away from them and they all take it personally even though they go it's just business it's not it's personal it's always personal and so um we didn't um uh, and then you know galactic the new galactica uh, came out of richards and yeah, let's well, talk about that. You were on, you know, Richard Hatch created a uh, it was, trailer. Right. It was called and, The Second Coming. Coming. And I was the only actor from the original show who did it with him. And this was... I think John Carlos was on it, too. Yes, yeah. John Carlos. Carlos. Did it, but we just actually used a small piece of footage of his. And Richard put all his own money into it. He was determined to get the show to move forward. And the concept was to take the original cast move them out 30 years and make them the senior cast and bring in a whole new younger cast, move the story forward. Universal wanted no part of it. Um, Glenn wanted no part of it. We, you know, it, the, everybody told us there's no demand for Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. So we went out and took the five minute trailer out on the convention yeah. circuit. And I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people wrote in, but that's why the new one got done. Yeah. And I have my own suspicions why they did it the way they did. I, you know, when they handed it to Ron Moore and he just remade the original, we kind of all looked at each other. And I think this goes back to the old separation of powers between talent and production. I don't, I think they realized there was a market for it and then the powers that be didn't want actors telling them what, what to do. But the new one was incredibly successful in its own way because it had a whole generation, different generation of actors. Um, so it had its, had its own audience. The only person that they put in it was Richard. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that was because he was the driving force uh, behind. Uh, but we were the, you know, the first of the entrepreneurial do-it-yourself <laughs> pilots, which is now how the industry works. You know, everybody's doing their own films uh, on their iPhone. So I've always heard, I saw the, the the trailer for the Second Coming. Uh, I heard there was actually it's going to be longer. It was actually like a, maybe a thirty minute uh, piece yep. made into a trailer. Yep, we shot we shot probably enough for over twenty minutes, and and we did expand the theme. But the original idea was to get the show back on the air, and we had to be very careful because we did not own the rights yeah. to Battlestar Galactica. This was always something we knew, and. I think we got away with it because we were constantly approaching Universal to say, look what these fans want. They're writing in, they're writing in, they're writing in. Once they gave it to Ron Moore, we had to cease and desist because it was no longer ours to, to promote. Um, and, I, and I honestly believe Ron Moore put Richard in it because Richard was the driving force. Yeah. force I mean, he wrote the books. Um, you know, I, I, we all... You know, the, the great thing about Galactica was, was, you know, the story which had so many elements that had never been explored. You know, Glenn's Mormon background and then, you know, the whole Egyptian motif on this goes back to, you know, our, you know, were we ever here? Were, you know, where did the population of this planet come from? That, you know, getting into all of, you know, evolutionary theory and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there was a lot to be explored there. We always thought, that it was a gold mine, but they they didn't mine it. Um, interesting, so interesting too, though, that when they did not do what we all thought was the most logical thing to do, here 40 years later, what did the new Star Wars do? They took the original cast, made them the old people, and brought in the new cast, and they were successful. You know, the first three Star Wars were incredibly successful, the middle three were incredible failures, and now they go back and take, okay, you know, and you know what? The tongue-in-cheek was back. Harrison Ford was back. 
t tongue in cheek. Carrie Fisher, tongue in cheek. And Mark Hamill, of course, now is going to be the new Obi Wan Kenobi. And it will go forward, and you will keep generations of, of Star Wars followers and just keep adding on to it. It was, it was the strategy they should have used in the beginning. It's funny. We started it. We thought of it first. So. <laughs> it's funny, too, because uh, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, 2000, they were thinking of doing a new Battlestar Galactica and uh, continue with the original cast. Uh, unfortunately, 9-11 happened. They were actually building sets and everything. I, I, you know, that was rumor and stuff. There was always a battle to who owned yeah. rights. Glenn always was always adamant that he owned this and that. But I, I don't know. At, at that point, you know, it's out of all of our hands. You just wait for a phone call that says show up on the set. Other than that, you have no power to, to do anything. Um, I still think there is a market for it. I mean, I hear rumors today that uh, um, who have I, you know, the original director that we thought was on board. Oh, I can't Brian think of his name. Brian Singer is still very much interested in, in, in doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know where the rights are, you know, or anything. Um, somebody called me up and said, hey, you know, we need, we need an old Bojay, you know, who's a cantankerous old man wandering around the lower decks of the <laughs> ship. Are you available? Yep. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, how it would go. I can see you still doing it, holding the laser pistol and going oh, for it. Oh, golly. I think, you know, actually, you know, when Richard and I discussed, what do we want to do with our characters going forward? And I wrote a lot of stuff out, and Richard and I were very much in agreement on this. Bo J was going to be the head of R&D. Um, and he was going to be the one, almost like the George Kennedy character in the old airplane movies. And, you know, you know and quit wrecking my fighters. And I still don't think there's anybody out there who could fly that Viper any better than I can, even though I'm too old to fly. So this kind of cranky, cantankerous guy, you know, um, still with the passion to do, you know, what he did. And that's how we envisioned BoJ going forward. Richard, of course, would have become Adam, the Adama character. Um, and then, you know, just a whole new, you know, cast of young people. But the story itself had to move out beyond the Cylons. And that would have been the, fu the fun of it, to. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, you know, the whole thing that, you know, bothered me is that the story itself is you can never find Earth mm -hmm. because that ends the story. Yeah. You, you, now you have to define what Earth is. Right. And so, you know, when in the end of, you know, Glock 98, they came to Earth and, well, uh-oh, you've just now sunk the ship. Yeah. yeah so the, I, I never thought you would, should ever find Earth and that story should always be, always be the search because... If you, if when, once you find it, you have to make a definitive statement of what it is, and we're now still slaughtering ourselves on this planet trying to figure out what it is. Yeah. Well, I'm personally a fan of the original show, and it, it's funny how uh, people nowadays say, oh, the, the 1970, the original show, so campy, and it's, you know, it was, uh, it was terrible. But in those days, that was still, I think, one of the most epic shows that was on television. I mean, look at the bridge alone. I mean, you don't find sets that well. Like it was that. never made to go on television, and that and that was that was the great thing. It, it was a three-hour movie yeah. um, that had higher ratings than anything since Brian's song, and ABC in their wisdom went, "Oh boy, let's turn it into a series," and there was no pre-production. Um, the classic example of pre-production of sci-fi was Bab 5. Babylon 5 had five years of scripts, special effects, storylines, and everything before they went into production. Um, we had the special effects. There's no such thing as CGI back then. The space effects are what was in the, the pilot. Um, so that's why you see the Vipers go this way. Then they reverse the film, and the Vipers go that way. But that's all, all there was. And, you, and you, had, you had nothing more. The set was square cornered and huge and immense with cubby holes up. You couldn't get, again, this is before steady camps. you couldn't get a dolly in there. So you would shoot three lines, you'd run out of space and you'd have to relight down over there. The show just was behind from, from day one. You could not make an hour show of, that, of Battlestar in what we called the seven day window, seven shooting days, which was the standard for um, hour long television. I mean, the crew loved it. The crew was in diamond time. I mean, you know, they were making more money than, any, than anybody, but we were working 14-hour days. And uh, so...
Well, that's disappointing. I never really got to a chance to continue that original version. But let's talk more about you. Uh, we talked a lot about Battlestar. I think we talked more about uh, Battlestar than you being on it. Um, You've been, you know, a lot of people thought, okay, he disappeared. But you've been doing a lot of regional theater, I yeah. guess, in Monterey area. Yeah, right. I, you know, it's it's interesting. I I was, I was lucky enough to be in the working actor category. It's it's one of those things that people will say, what did you do? And I get, I go, well, just go to IMDb, and they go, holy mackerel! I mean, I mean, I, you know, I did sixty different primetime shows and movies of the week and stuff and and. When I sort of knew that the industry's young, and you know, you kind of, you know, like an old ball player, you know, it, it may be time, you know, to go. And I never wanted to give up what I loved to do. My love was always theater, and it's what I was trained in. And it was always, my preference would always have been to stay in the theater. I mean, my, I always wanted to be on Broadway. Um, but television paid you. Mm -hmm. And theater, no, notoriously, you know, we, we all started there. But I wanted to go back to my theater roots. And I was hysterically lucky to have a dear, dear friend of mine who was a wonderful theater director call me up and said, how would you like to do a huge production of Guys and Dolls? And I went, what? And, and she said, yeah, I, need you, I want you to come play Sky. And I went, I have I haven't done a musical in 20 years. I can't sing that. I, I, I could probably fake luck be a lady, but I can't sing. I've never been in love before. And she said, I want the actor for the role. You'll sing it well enough. Well, to make a long story short, I, I laughed and thought, you know, I was a confident actor. And I agreed to do this and went into terror mode. And I'm, and I'm serious. I mean, you talk about lacking confidence and doubting. I got in this thing surrounded by equity singers and dancers and I was the headliner that they brought in and I stunk um, simply because I had no confidence and you know what got me through it was a this director and going back and going go back to the days when they you were nurtured and you were told you can be confident and you can be and you can't do it wrong and you have to believe and it was that those goes back to those early all my children experiences got me through the rehearsal process of that and when we opened we got rave reviews and that put me back um, the last literally eight or nine years that I was in LA I did much more theater than I did television I I became the Harold Hill son. Southern California used to do Music Man everywhere, but I got to do Oliver. I got to do My Fair Lady with Dale Christian, who was the star of Phantom with Michael Crawford. Uh, and, you know, again, going back on stage, um, especially in the musical theater, which I, which I loved, it's that immediacy, that being there and having the audience there and, and being able to tell the story from beginning to end, you know, going back and doing roles that I wanted to continue all my life. Mr. Roberts has always been my favorite play. You know, got to do that twice and, and direct it twice. And uh, the, I just loved it. And um, in, after 2000, you know, I, I, there was an opportunity to go up and be a resident director of theater in Monterey. And on top of that, you know, there was a very famous tennis club up there and I was a tennis pro. Um, they said, well, come on up and teach here. And I wasn't working enough that I was happy. Um, and, you know, it, it's the hardest thing in the world is to walk away. Um, and uh, so I walked away. Well, actually, I didn't walk away. My wife made me walk away. Um, and she did it in, in such a way that... You know, she looked at me and said, I, you're unhappy and you're miserable and you're angry. And, yep, you know, you do, you do get that way when you can't do what you love and you have expertise and you have the ability. And all I wanted to do was be able to do what I did best and show people, help other people, younger people coming forward. And the only way to do it was to get out of there. So, I mean... Bless her heart, my wife sold the house, packed up the furniture, put it in a moving van, put me in a car. And, because uh, I'd, I'd have never left. I, I, no actor 
leaves. I, I was Captain Smith. I would have gone right down on that boat, right down on the Titanic. Um, but, you know, up north, I spent the last 10 years directing a lot of theater. Um, I don't perform too much. Um, but both community theater and professional theater, um, I just feel so strongly about paying forward. Um, we live in a world that is full of negativity and, and criticism. And the arts are the one place that there should be no neg negativity because in a creative process, there's nothing you can do that's wrong. And I had many people along the length of my career use their power position to, you know, humiliate somebody under them. Well, will you call yourself an actor? What, why are you doing it like that? Whoever taught you to do this, blah, blah, blah. And the word no never comes out of my mouth as a director. You cannot do this role wrong. We need to be nurtured. We need to be encouraged, especially in something that's interpretive. Um, and I love watching, putting a comedy or a musical or a drama up on a stage and watching people who have day jobs at a car dealership or an insurance company these people who all their life had these creative drives that for one reason or another they they had to not do it you know they had to establish priorities i have to i have to feed my family i have to do this but i always wanted to do that and i go that's why they invented community theater you come down and and you do this and i get them up on the stage and you watch their faces light up and you watch the performances come out of them and as and as a director i am confident enough in my own ability that I will tell these people, I promise you, you will look really good up there. That's my job. If you will not be afraid, if you will open up your heart, and they look at me and I go, I will tell you the secret to acting. Acting is like falling in love. It only works if you jump in with both feet. And when you do, you open yourself up to all the wonder of it, but you also open yourself up to all the despair of it. I will protect you from the despair. I promise you that. That's my promise to you. And, and, and then, you know, a show opens, and I sit in back of the theater, and I look at it, and all I go is, damn, I want to be up there with him. <laughs> always an actor. No yeah, what. yeah. It's, it, old soldiers, you know, gradually fade away. Old actors always think there's one more gig out there. Well, is, is there a gig that you're about to talking about gigs? There's something about a World War II ship? Oh, golly, this broke my heart. Um, oh. I, I put together a deal, and again, this is Mr. Roberts. I wanted to do this since 1970. It was, and again, now I'm, I have to go back to my college, and the senior director, and I was a sophomore, um, they did Mr. Roberts, and I was hired as Pulver. And I loved the play. I just, I'd love the play. I'd seen the movie. Anyway, um, we were in rehearsal, and um, he came up to me, um, and he said, God, you're wonderful doing this. And I said, oh, thank you, thank you, because I just wanted a compliment, because I was a sophomore, you know, and I was the youngest person in the cast. He said, do you know what would make you really wonderful? And I said, what? He said, if you didn't do it like Jack Lemmon. And that opened my eyes because basically I was copying Jack Lemmon's performance, which was wonderful. And he looked at me and said, trust yourself to be you. Bring what everything you have to. And I looked at him and he looked at me and he said, trust me, I won't let you look bad. And, uh, and this was 1966. Anyway. Um, I'd fallen in love with that play. It's one of those things. There's another actor, Robert Hayes from Airplane. He feels the same way. We used to laugh and go, when are you going to do Mr. Roberts? Whenever they call me, anytime, anyplace, and anywhere. But I'd always wanted to do it on a ship. I was visiting my old college friend who lives in Wilmington, North Carolina. The USS North Carolina is there. They're desperately raising money to restore that ship. I was visiting. I said, well, I know how to raise money. Let's put up Roberts on the aft deck. I was only there for a week. In three days, we had meetings with the city, the city of Wilmington, the head of the Restoration Committee, and the biggest theater there. We put together the deal. We're going to do it on the aft deck of, of, the, of the ship. And I didn't want to be perceived as the person who came in and take over because there's an established theater there called the Thalian Theater. 
And I didn't want that, oh, you're the Hollywood guy coming in. And I said, look, you can have anybody you want direct this. I will give you any help you want because I've had the idea of how to put this up on a ship for 30 years. All I want to do is play Doc, which is the third character in the trilogy. It's Pulver, Roberts, and Doc. And I want to finish the trilogy, but I will be your technical advisor and all this. I will help you with publicity because this will be huge. Nobody's ever done this. Um, they scheduled it for July 4th of 2017. This past early summer, I went back to Wilmington to finalize the deal, and they basically said, well, we don't want to pay you anything. Um, the theater was a non-equity company. I, you know, my partner down there says, look, we won't have the theater pay him. We'll, we'll, get a, we'll raise money. We'll get a, a producing enterprise so we can pay you. They wouldn't do it. Basically, they had the idea. Somebody at the top of the theater there the, in the money end said, well, he gave you the idea. So just go run with it. You don't need him anymore. And they screwed us. Oh, I'm sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Broke my heart. Yeah, but, you know, again, how, how, did you let, how did I let them do that? Well, I was visiting. You know, I mean, we literally stood on the aft of the ship, and all I could think of was Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. This is the barn. Let's put on a play. And I brought it up. And Scott, you know, my friend who was a marketing executive for Fox Sports all his life, we started to talk to people. And we never drew up documents, you know, that protected my idea. There are simple non-disclosure documents that you can get on, you know, lawyer.com, which you get people to sign saying, listen, we're going to tell you the idea, but you can't use it. We, did, we didn't have them. Uh, and we didn't have time to get them done because we were in the right place at the right, at exactly the right time. And I really thought this was going to go. And it didn't, and it, and it really hurt. It, it hurt. But that is showbiz, as they say. Yeah. Well, are you still directing now on, on some of the Yeah, I mean, again, you know, um, I'm going to direct a Christmas show, um, which is, you know, a really, I th half the people are either going to walk out uh, or not. But this is, um, you know, a, a semi comedy. Um, which fe features this kind of dysfunctional family that they do get together for Christmas. There's the, the husband, the wife, the older son who has left home, the left the family business and, you know, the big fight with him and his father, and his younger brother who is a mute, who has never spoken. And um, as they come back for Christmas, this, this one year the um, son has married a Jewish girl into this Catholic family. So this dinner, you know, Christmas Eve dinner now gets into the religious battles and stuff like that. And the child that's never spoke, who's 20, you know, um, who doesn't say a word in the first act, it just eating, and, and, you know, looks up at the very end of the first act and says, you're all wrong about this, you know. And then the second act is that this young 20-year-old actor, he takes over the show, and you don't know who's speaking. But they, they don't solve anything, but they create just a tremendous amount of, okay, this is what we're supposed to believe, but is this necessarily true about many things about religion? And I just love it. And, and the end of the show, you know, well, just is fabulous without stating definitely what it is, but it's got a great ending, and I can't wait to put this up. Um, Did you say the name of it? Um, I, you know, and it's gone out of my head because <laughs> okay. I, I knew that was coming. Uh, I, kn I knew it was it? coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming because the word Christmas is Silent Night. Okay. Um, um, anyway, and it's just, it's a great, it's a great play, and like I say, you know, I, I can see half the theater walking out at intermission. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be in the Monterey area? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. definitely something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, I've learned a lot. Actually, listening to you, and I've learned a lot listening to you right here. It's, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I am so passionate, and, and, I'm, and I'm so passionate about giving forward. And if I, you know, can now look at the camera, and I, and I would say to any young person who had ever dreamed of Doing something in the creative arts, you know, whether it's singing, dancing, sculpture, painting, acting, and everything, and somebody told you, when are you going to grow up? Please, please don't listen to them. I've been Peter Pan my whole life. Wow. We need, and you need to be able to pursue 
things that you love, yes, you have priorities in your life, and yay, yes, you may have to feed your family, and yes, you may have to prioritize yourself that you do have to go work for this car dealership in order to make money, but do not ever give up your dreams of doing these things, because there are ways to do it. That's why they invented community theater. You know, as I, as I laughingly say, you know, when your boss has screamed at you at four o'clock in the afternoon, before you say something that might get you fired, all you have to do is think, in an hour I get to go to the theater and he'll still be in. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks very much for doing it. You're it's, welcome. It's actually fun, a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah. For more full-length celebrity interviews, visit SidewalksTV.com.